What's up everyone? I'm Dimit the Stanley Miroff and I'm a London-based SaaS entrepreneur and operator. I've been in the talent acquisition space for the better part of a decade, but spent the last couple of years building machine learning forecasting software for sales. After a brief hiatus, I'm back in the talent acquisition space, having recently joined Handshake, the world's largest early talent network, as head of EMEA. In this podcast series, I catch up with some of my old industry friends and thought leaders to discuss the latest trends in the emerging talent space. I speak to some of our employer partners who provide tactical advice on how to best identify, attract, and engage early talent. And lastly, I chat to some of my colleagues here at Handshake, giving you a behind the scene peek into how the world's fastest growing edtech company is being built. Live, normally we actually start with a quick introduction. I'd like to think that people who come and speak to me don't need an introduction, but just to be on the safe side, over to you, Johnny. Uh, thanks, Divitar. So Johnny Campbell, I'm CEO, co-founder of Social Talent. I am a reformed recruiter. I started recruiting back in 98. Um, uh, so a long time in recruiting, started my own staffing agency, pivoted into Social Talent, which became the largest learning platform for recruiters, sourcers, and uh, hiring managers in the world. Uh, we did this quite accidentally, but uh, certainly see the role that we have in the industry today is to try and spread education, best practice, and knowledge to make hiring better. Amazing. And so you said you've been on quite a journey. You and I had a quick catch up uh, last week and you said that where you started, you know, seven, eight years ago, has it been seven, eight years already or? Gosh, well, 12 years ago, <laughs> since I set up our first agency in the last recession and then 10 years, um, just coming up on 10 years since Social Talent was formed. Crazy, right? And and so you started, you were pretty niche, you know, when you first started, right? Uh, the training that you provided, then he's gone quite wide i suppose now so can we talk about this for a little bit like how you ended up why did you choose so you started off um teaching people how to to source right that was kind of the first first i, I wrote it back listen i set up a staffing agency in the recession and right man it was it was hell and we had to find you know i was at that point like everybody else in 2008 relying on a big database of, of contacts and i realized mm. that, that wasn't going to cut it and social media was exploding so i was like i got to use this is a way, surely this is a way people are putting their names online with their professions and their locations. I can use this. This is this search material. And right. anyway, I kind of through through just finding stuff on the internet, whether it was it was by Shally or Jim Stroud or others, reading stuff and going, okay, I can learn how to search and learning the algorithms of how Google works, et cetera. And then trial and error, brute force on social media to post jobs. We figured out a way of recruiting. Um, eventually then decided that the business shouldn't be running a staffing agency, should be teaching people how to do what we've learned on mm. scale because, hey, guess what? Everyone else was finding the same problem. Um, and we scaled it out initially by training, I'll be honest with you, largely recruiters in other staffing agencies who kind of, kind of had the need the most. And eventually as we demand increased, we needed to scale that and move quickly onto an online platform, put our courses online. And then as those as companies began to solve the sourcing problem, if you like, they yeah. started leaning on us for all the other issues, you know, engaging candidates, our employer branding, our interviewing, our hiring manager uh, relationships. And we yeah. started, you know, scaling with more experts. We brought in because our expertise was limited to what we knew, I knew. Yeah. And we brought in the world's, what we thought were the world's best experts on all the other topics. And that's what made Social Talent what it is today, which is if you look across the entire hiring landscape, whether you're a sourcer, recruiter, recruiting leader, or a hiring manager, or a HR BP, we have the learning to, to give you everything you need to know to, to do learning really effectively. Um, and we're even evolving that because we have mature users who came on our platform as the manager of, gosh, engineering or sales, learned how to interview, and now they're kind of going, great, now I have a team, can you teach me how to manage them, grow yeah. them, develop them? And so yeah. we're heading on that journey with those users too. Amazing. And so going back to where you started, you kind of started, you know, arguably accidentally landed on, on sourcing, you know, trying to solve your own problem. Then you figured out this really works. And what's more, people don't know how to do it, right? Um, you know, let's call it eight years ago. In in that space of time, call it a decade, call it five, six years, direct sourcing has kind of established itself as the norm for attracting talent, right? With is it fair is it fair to say that we've moved or we have been moving further and further away from sort of reacting, recruiting, more into proactive recruiting and direct sourcing. Is that fair to say, would you say? I think it is fair to say. If you look, if you go back even, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, what we call today direct sourcing was called executive search, right? So right. You, did this, you did this for senior level roles. You went and you had a research team and you went through probably all 
pardon me, old school methods to try and find people. Uh, you know, what's happened over the last 30 years is that the average salary at which you, at which you search for has just come down, right? <laughs> so right, right. it's come down from 100K jobs to 60K jobs, to 40K jobs, to people source, you know, what we would call blue collar and gray collar roles and graduates these days, or at least yeah. they want to. And I think that's, you know, we've seen that, you know, what was, you know, the, if you think about two, two factors here, one is the, the supply and the demand factors. So mm -hmm. supply of top tier executive talent would have been considered to be small, demand growing as people wanted better mm -hmm. executives. And yeah. then the cost of acquiring those, it was worth putting the effort in for you know a 200k job it wasn't worth putting into a 20k job sure but now the demand is high for all of these skills the supply as in the supply being the ability to find them quickly is is difficult and the costs of doing it are just much lower yeah, yeah. i think that's that's why sourcing i think it's you really see this this renaissance in in search right that like yeah. came this thing called sourcing because the the market demanded us um, do it that we do it because it was just harder to find the talent, but also yeah. the costs of doing it plummeted. That's critical. That's the technology, the process, the amount of people doing it, the techniques improved, and those two things combined means you can source for anything these days. Yeah, and so so you touched on an interesting point though. You know, direct search and um, sourcing, let's call it, started off focusing on people up top, right? People with high in the high salary brackets, et cetera, because as you said, the supply of um, such people was way lower uh, and they were just hard to find. So um, one of the things, the nuances that you kind of touched upon was that the reason, for example, why direct sourcing has sort of lagged, let's say for lack of a better term, in the sort of emerging early talent vertical was because uh, there were way too many graduates. Everyone is looking for a job and it's really easy to, to find some. Now you said, nowadays, People are sourcing for early talent. You said even blue collar jobs. Why? Why is that? Why? You know. Well, two questions, I suppose. Number one is, and I, I kind of feel like you semi answer this one. Why did it take so long to move from exec search to sourcing across the board, and why now? So sourcing's hard, right? And it's expensive, right? <laughs> right. It, like, it just is, right? So if you don't have to do it, you shouldn't do it. And the main reason why we weren't sourcing for every single role is you just didn't have to. You could, if you were looking for, let's say, a retail job, you'd run an ad and you'd find somebody. You'd find lots of applicants. And therefore, you're, you know, as long as you basically work through the process of, of going through all those applicants, you could find enough people to do the jobs you need. So you don't need to source. Mm. So I think that, that's been the main reason sourcing uh, took so long to get across the entire entire organization and across uh, most worked work roles or profiles is because it just wasn't necessary right What's changed though i think um there's a few things that's changed i think one is that um and this is a really important one uh the 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 candidates uh, uh expectations of a process and their tolerance for crappy process is it's just it's, it's being eroded over the years you know i remember when we first started social talent maybe eight years ago we did a wor work with a, a law firm here in dublin one of the biggest law firms in dublin and mm -hmm. of course being a law firm they mainly focused on graduate recruiting and the, the one of the problems they were trying to solve eight years ago was the fact that when uh, someone was filling out their form, their application form, which was online because they were more progressive, it was not an application nice. form. It took about an hour to fill it out. And wow. if you lost your internet connection at any point during that hour, you'd wipe the entire form and have to start again. Wow. And so they were trying to find technology that would move them <laughs> to a different way. And I was like, I, because I, 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 had, I, I had been 10 years since I was a graduate applying for jobs. And hey, I'm not a lawyer, so I never have to do a 10 page application. Um, <laughs> I was just, I was just mesmerized. I was like, seriously, is this, this the way it works? Like, yeah. Like, and they were considered to be more progressive because it was an online form, but it just yeah. failed. Yeah. So I think that's just what you had to do. Right. But, yeah. but I, I always say that when you're looking at behavior, um, it's dangerous to look at the narrow use case of behavior. So for example, hiring, and you go, mm -hmm. you know, what do people accept as a hiring process? And you go, hang on a second, what do people accept as a digital process? Because a hiring process is just another digital process these days. And yeah. if you, you know, you can't say, well, hiring processes look like this and buying a pizza looks like this and buying a t-shirt looks like this. It's like, like, no, 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 hang on a second. My device that I do it all on is the same. And I am the same person. Therefore, I consider them all to be transactions. 
right? Mm. A transaction where I'm providing information. I was online last night, uh, uh, Dimi, and I was looking up, uh, I was trying to buy t-shirts. I buy crappy t-shirts from old movie posters and stuff like that, right? Right. I right. went onto a site, I went onto a site and I was like, I'm not, uh, we're about to go into lockdown here in Ireland. I'm not gonna be able to go to a store and buy clothes right. for a long time, right? Not that I'm going anywhere, <laughs> but I like my t-shirts, right? 15 right. book t-shirts, right? So I went onto this site and I picked out a couple of t-shirts. I was like, oh, cool. Added them to my cart. And then I got to the cart, two things. One, the cart was empty. It hadn't, hadn't stored at all. And second oh. of all, they don't do Apple Pay, which meant I knew I wanted to fill out my whole address on my credit card. And I just abandoned it and, and closed my phone and went to bed. Mm. Right? Because I was like, oh, ah, screw this. I don't want them that much, right? Yeah, yeah. So you look at a graduate applying for a job. Okay, she needs a job, right? Or you go back two years ago, right? To the world of 2018, right? Yeah. 2019, <laughs> right? Last year, a graduate didn't really have to work too hard because, you know, every company was screaming that they're looking for the best early career talent, um, whatever that might look like. So therefore, if you kind of just sat there, the companies would probably find you if you're a good talent, right? If you have good academics or you're, you know, you're, you have that kind of uh, ingenuity for entrepreneurship or whatever it might be, you could probably expect to someone, someone will come find you and they probably will. Yeah. So therefore, why bother? Like, why work so hard to put the t-shirt back into the cart yeah. <laughs> and then all your details again, right? And I think that's that. That's what I think in, in early career hiring, you know, initially it was like, well, let's just make the process better. And a lot of the money went into technology around the process. Yeah. You know, and I think now because that costs money and you just have, you have to work on that problem, I think more and more people are saying, well, hang on a second. If for all the other roles we have in the business, we don't just work on process. We also source the talent. And that works yeah. pretty effectively. I think people are then asking, well, can we not source this talent too? Yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, you kind of mentioned quite a few things. The main one perhaps being that candidates' expectations have leveled up based on usage of, let's say, the, the iPhone predominantly and just technology advancing and then kind of realizing, why should I have a crap experience? I can purchase, as you say, a tissue with a click of a button. Why should I spend an hour and a half filling in an application form? Where do you think, in, in, in that context, where, where do you think employers kind of come into the equation? Because obviously, you know, you're saying candidates no longer have to put, put up with BS processes, which is absolutely fair. Um, but where, you know, how, how do you think about employers here? Obviously, um, it, you know, go back two years ago, Plenty of um, um, you know, plenty of jobs around. People would apply, and therefore you need to make more of an effort. This year, things are probably looking a little bit different. Next year as well, things are going to look different. We're kind of headed into you know what seems a pretty deep recession. How do you think this affects uh, the, the the process? Uh, so one is just tackling the recession piece, right? One uh, a phrase I didn't even I never heard of before uh, April this year was the K shape uh, recovery, right? Um, the K shape, the K shape is important, right? Because it, there isn't. This isn't like the last crisis where you know pretty much every every company was down a bit and or down a lot and had to grow out of it. Um, there are sectors booming right now, and there mm. are sectors that are going to be in trouble for years, right? Mm. Mm. And so, therefore, if you look at the graduate population, it isn't that the graduates are, are going into a market where everything's suppressed. You're going into a mm. market where, for argument's sake, half the market's booming, half the market's yeah. collapsed. So yeah. it probably depends on your depends on your undergraduate uh, degree, perhaps, and it depends on your background. You are either in a category where there is no problem, the market is still growing like crazy or faster than crazy, and therefore what we just discussed, 19 and 18's version of the world, still applies to you or even more. And then you've got a bunch of graduates who are going, going coming out, early career talent, who are going into a market where you're going, yeah. how the heck do I find a, find a job in this world, right? So that's important. It isn't just, you know, and there's a danger in employers thinking, Oh, there's a risk. And they do. And I say employers, remember, an employer is not a thing. The people who hire within an organization are the real things, right? Mm, mm. There can be this, you know, you read in the in, 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 in online, you read all these things about, about, uh, about the recession. And therefore, you kind of go, there's loads of people out there. Now you got a recruiter going, not for what we're looking for. <laughs> oh, hang on a second. You want a data scientist? You want, uh, uh, you know, you want somebody who's going to be, um, uh, you know, do SaaS sales and work in the sales team? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. they don't exist. Our new CSM that we talked earlier on about, customer success managers. I have this in my business. We're hiring for customer success managers at the moment. We're hiring for relationship managers for enterprise sales, a new business for enterprise sales. And yeah. my own hiring manager said to me, uh, sorry, our, our, our head of finance budgeting goes, oh yeah, but it's going to be easier to find them now for the next couple of years. I'm like, 
Dude, is it? <laughs> impossible to find. They were impossible to find last year. They're still impossible to find. This recession doesn't change anything because enterprise SaaS is planning away. There's so mm. many sectors that are planning away. FMCG is planning away. Yeah. You know, healthcare to a degree is planning away as well. So many sectors are doing just fine. And yeah. those, the graduate hires in those companies will continue to hire. Yeah. And in fact, you know, uh, more than ever. So for those individuals, you know, employers, first of all, need to recognize what is the landscape. You know, there aren't, there isn't one landscape. There are multiple landscapes. You need to yeah. figure out which landscape are you in. And if you're in the one of the landscapes, let's say half the half the market, where the demand is still outstripping the supply of talent, you you can't afford to fall behind. Yeah. Uh, you've got to go after the right the right talent here, and you've got to make sure you're getting the best talent in. And 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 I know you haven't finished your thought, but something really interesting occurs um, to me. You know, listening listening to you speak. So, even if you find yourself in an industry where demand is by far outstripping supply, in the context of this recession, where other people might be, you know, other graduates, let's say, uh, might be um, their degrees might better align with a different uh, a, a different vertical, which might have taken a significant hit. Is it fair to say that those people basically will start applying for jobs that might not be their first choice? So, if, for example, let's say, um, you know, the example you gave with customer success in SaaS, you know, super high to fill roles, um, difficult to find. Um, but now on top of that, you have people who are not necessarily qualified applying for, for jobs. Do you think this is going to, because I know it's happening like in, in, you know, in other kind of areas, right? You've seen a huge surge in number of applications, which is putting a lot of pressure on the, on the pipeline, right? Yeah. So, and this has an interesting effect on sourcing as well, right? So um, I've seen across the board, uh, across all levels of roles in an organization, the feedback I'm getting from enterprises is that the, the volume of applications has gone up 4x, right? 4x. So this puts in 4x, right? Wow. On, on okay. what they have, right? So, yeah. so ignoring, ignoring the amount of vacancies that are open. So in some it's up, in some it's down, in some it's, it's the same. 4x across the board in terms of volume yeah. of applications, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, these aren't considered applications necessary. It's kind of people yeah. going, just got to get my name out there. Yeah. So, so, so two things happen. One is organizations, uh, with, with respecting the need for a, a continued good candidate experience and good brand on Glassdoor or elsewhere, right? They know they have to get back to these people because a negative mm. candidate experience, mm. particularly in consumer-oriented businesses, uh, is, is just terrible. And it costs money to do that. So there's been this brand new pressure to scale response management, right? And loads of people yeah. coming in with solutions or response management and so on and so forth. But the other thing is people go, do you know what? Considering I get 4X the amount of applications, maybe I just won't advertise these jobs. Maybe I just need to go and source. So sourcing, again, the cost of sourcing starts to fall relative to the cost mm. of advertising. Because if you're going to have to manage and manage at a pretty decent high engagement level, the response of 4X volume at the top of your funnel, you're kind of going, I got to put people on that. I got to basically get back to everybody, got to put technology in. Do you know what? Maybe I don't want the applicants in the first place. Maybe now yeah. the cost of, of filtering has become so expensive. Filtering while still giving good feedback has become yeah. so expensive. And I'm so worried about the damage to my reputation if I don't get back to all those people. I'd rather just zoom in on the exact people I want to target and put my efforts in there. So yeah. again, that I think builds a business case for sourcing in light of more applicants, which may seem yeah. ironic, but the, but the economics makes sense. No, it makes sense, yeah. So basically what we're seeing, um, if I understood correctly, is kind of shifts from budget and where companies are spending money within the pipeline. So I remember actually seeing something from the Institute of Student Employers, data from like, say, 2018, 19, maybe, and I think around 27 to 30% of all graduate recruitment budgets was spent on talent identification and attraction, and everything else was basically spent on, you know, uh, assessment days and kind of marketing collateral and, and all that kind of jazz. So I guess what I'm hearing here is that, you know, in the economic context that we described, it makes a lot more sense to start shifting budgets and kind of moving the top of the funnel so you can basically narrow the funnel and make sure that you've got more qualified applicants instead of trying to solve all these problems further down, spending an absurd amount of money on assessment days and applications and everything else. Big time, it's, it's, you know, do you focus on quality or quantity? Quality costs mm. money to focus on. Quantity, there's a perception that quantity um, is inexpensive and let's go for quantity. But quantity has its own costs if right. you want to have and maintain a good candidate experience and good reputation in the market, which yeah. in the particularly early career is probably arguably even more important. There's a perception that early career talent is even more informed as to your reputation and, and, and what people think of you and are more influenced by that. So therefore you kind of, you're kind of going, gosh, if I, if I, 
if I keep using the old methods, I'm going to have to put more money into managing the, the top of the pipeline, even more money into, into shaping my brand. Hang on a second. I'll just be targeted. Like this is yeah. just, let's give this a go. And, and because the economies of doing sourcing are just much more effective these days in 2020 than they used to be. That yeah. actually, it, it, it is something that works. But critically, critically, you have to be able to do that. And we haven't brought this up yet. One of the other reasons why organizations I don't think have a source early career t- talent is that sourcing has been predominantly a keyword search process. And it's hard. Right. I've always I've always maintained like give me a data scientist role all day long. I used to the last time I, I I sourced for for clients, I was sourcing for catastrophe insurance modeling actuaries, right? Wow. Beautiful <laughs> roles to like totally a handful in the world, but I can find very unique data. Uh, like job titles, skills, professions, qualifications that those individuals will have that really zone on who they are and a small subset of employers that they would work for. So from a keyword point of perspective, I can really zoom in with a really good search on exactly who I need to find. Mm, and find. Mm. I want someone who's great with people. How the hell yeah. do you search for them? Yeah. You know what I mean? I want someone who's motivated, driven, and you know what? Smart. <laughs> oh, like... Like, oh, uh, I'll, just, I'll just keyword search motivated, driven, and smart, and I'll find perfect yeah. people. No, you yeah. won't, right? You find yeah. crap because people put that on their profile and yeah. you have no idea if it's true or not. If I say I have a degree in actuarial science, it's probably true, right? 90% yeah. of the time it's going to be true. Yeah. I'm motivated and high energy. I'm ignoring that completely. I don't believe a word someone says. <laughs> so there's a challenge there because, you know, all of this stuff we've talked about would absolutely drive you to source, but you need to be able to source for sure. skills and competencies that have to be have to be searchable, right? And somebody yeah. has to fix that. And and that has been also a challenge in the last decade. That wasn't really there for early career talent, yeah. I don't believe. Yeah. And do you think that is true? So I think last time we spoke, I told you I had had a chat with Hung. Um, and, you know, he kind of gave me his thoughts around why um, direct sourcing has sort of lagged a little bit in the early talent vertical. And, um, to kind of sum up his argument, I'm probably going to butcher it, so apologies, son. Um, but he was saying that one of the reasons is because at the very kind of early stages of your career, you, it's very difficult for you to differentiate yourself from anyone else. And therefore, from a direct sourcing standpoint, it's just very difficult to, to kind of find the, the exact skill set. Um, again, to your point, if you're looking for someone who's got a very specific degree or they have been in a specific on a specific career path for years, that's easier to search in terms of keywords. But early on, everyone kind of looks the same. Um, how, how much of that do you think is true? So I think it's a factor, right? It's definitely right. a factor that, that you know, it's, it's not, and it's not, again, I see it more from the perspective of who's doing the search, right? Less about, right. because I don't think, I, I don't think, a, an early career talent is sitting there saying to herself, oh, I'm not going to be findable, findable. I'm not, how do I distinguish myself? To the point mm. of in a in a high demand economy, I don't have to think, I just have to be, and someone will come and find me, right? Right. So right. I, don't, I don't think that I don't think they're staying up at night thinking about how they're found, right? They're just <laughs> getting on with their world and all of a sudden people like them get hired and they're going, well, that was easy, right? Right. Uh, at least at least in at least in the in the uptick of the K-shaped re- um, recovery, those folks are, are perhaps going to have that experience, right? Um, but that that is part of the problem. But even if that was solved, um there hasn't been the need within the employer set to do this, right? And yeah. it's only as you, again, sourcing is expensive. It's labor, has been labor intensive. Um, even if you had the keyword matching, there was some way of, of, of semantically finding individuals. Um, it was felt that for that salary level, because it's all about what's the salary we're paying, what's the perceived cost of sourcing, yeah. The maths don't make sense, right? Mm. Grad salaries, grad salaries, as you as you know well, in the West Coast and the US are like six figure salaries for yeah, yeah. scientists, yep. grads, developers, and stuff. You know, big books, and, and even in London, you get the same thing. You're yep. gonna get, you know, a I don't know whatever it's seventy thousand pounds, sixty thousand pounds. Not too sure whether with a high high end engineer is getting coming out of university, but she's getting yep. good money, right? Yeah, and getting more than more than you know a four year experienced accountant might get. So yep. again. The economics are because when I talk to customers about where they put, you know, exact search skills in, right? They're even changing the language. They're kind of like some of my key hires. So they, mm. they, they don't just talk about going deep into search for exec roles. It's more expensive roles. Yeah. And we live in a world where expensive doesn't necessarily mean you're an executive. You can be an expensive early career, 21-year-old software engineer. Yeah. But 
we're going to have to put the, the economics makes sense to go, hang on a second for $120,000. I'm going to put a bit of an effort into here to get a sourcer to, to find you. It makes yeah. sense to employ a sourcer for $100,000 to find me two engineers a month. Um, yeah. that economics work. It's, you know, it's, it's worth it. This is, yeah, this is a fascinating point, particularly in the context of engineering jobs. I guess, you know, you know, we're kind of seeing more and more of a decoupling from like your academic credentials and how good of an engineer you are. So, you know, the first example that springs to mind is my, my former co-founder who could have been, you know, writing code since he was eight, right? So forget his, his university degree. By the time he, he graduates, he's got a solid decade of, you know, software experience under his belt. So I guess, yeah, for someone like him, it, it totally makes sense to, and, and, and everything is searchable. You know, his GitHub repository is online, his Stack Overflow contribution is online. It's actually easy to, to, to identify someone like him. That's, that's fascinating. Um, final thing for me, Johnny, uh, and again, I'm surprised we, this didn't come up early in the conversation. Um, DNI, um, you know, where, where does this kind of, you know, tie into um, the, the, the wider conversation around sourcing, um, again, you know, particularly in line with the things that you said around at what point do we justify reaching out directly to people? At what point is too expensive, uh, et cetera? It's, you know, we speak to, obviously, just to kind of um, tell you why I'm asking, we speak to pretty much every, uh, at Handshake, pretty much every, you know, big employee in the world um, in the US. I think I told you last time when we, we spoke, um, Handshake works with 500 of the Fortune 500. So, a common problem we've seen is not lack of applicants, as, as we said, but very often in certain organizations is we have tons of applications direct, but they're not necessarily the people that you know we want to focus on right now. There are other, other priority candidates for us right now, and either they're not aware of what we do, or either they don't consider themselves, um, they, they wouldn't consider applying to us, whatever it might be. So at that point, you know, people start direct sourcing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like again, generally speaking, the the science says that once you create equal opportunity, that you will hire um, in the probably ratios you'd like to hire. Right? You don't you don't you don't set hiring goals. Um, right. Uh, sure. Around around different genders or ethnicities, etc. What yeah. you do is you you set um, slate goals. Slate goals work really well, which is the equal opportunity. Right? You want to have yeah. balanced slate, equal slate. So the slate doesn't represent the percentage of the amount of people in the population that that gender or color or ethnicity or belief represents. You try and yeah. make it more balanced. And then you let the hiring managers make decisions. And it turns out if that if you do that, they'll make actually really good decisions that end up hiring more equally across those those ethnicities or genders or whatever you're hiring for. So oftentimes what you're sourcing for is the is the minority gender or ethnicity that you're not finding naturally through applications or through your normal process. And so therefore you're trying to balance the slate out. So you would put sourcing effort in there. I see that a lot. And, and it works. Um, it works best though, and this is what I think is often ignored by recruiting teams. The best way to have diversity in your shortlist is have diversity in your recruiting team. Mm. It's really simple. You know, um, if you've got a bunch of white males in your recruiting team and you're trying to have diversity in all other non-white male ways, it, you know, you can read all the literature, all the things you want uh, as possible, but it's just probably going to fail because... Yeah. Whereas conversely, if you have real genuine diversity in your recruiting team, those people don't need to probably be taught much. They'll just naturally find themselves uh, searching from communities and in places that um, are perhaps more normal to them, less normal to their colleagues, but there's enough diversity of thought and expertise and background, et cetera, and upbringing that will just naturally drive that. So it is something that, you know, I talk a lot of teams about just generally, how do they source for diversity? It's like, well, what, what are you starting with? What, what does your team look like? Yeah. Um, and I think if you have a diverse recruiting team starting off, it just becomes easier. But definitely, yeah. I think there's there's a need to try and make sure that you 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 balance those slates, whether it's early career talent or, or professional talent. But also, there's there's an onus, and, and a lot of early career teams are trying to create pipeline. And so you yeah. see a lot of organizations who are trying to, and Google recently announced this uh, back in the, the end of the summer, where they're making it much more accessible for all different backgrounds to, to have an education that would be considered to be equivalent to a four-year computer science degree that would make you suitable for a job in Google, for example, yeah. um, you know, with a couple hundred bucks to do an online degree that takes six months or three months, right? Mm. And they're creating talent pools. I think this is you know, the really interesting angle that early, the opportunity early career recruiters have is to go create the pipeline. Don't just find the pipeline. Don't just find the diverse talent. What is your role in creating that pipeline for the yeah. future? Yeah, I love it. What a great way to, to wrap up today. I think um, uh, we're, we're just 
just the time now. So uh, I, I'd love to, to thank you for your time. It's been amazing. As always, I've learned tons uh, and I shall look forward to having you on another episode, hopefully very soon. Thank you. Thanks for having Excellent. me. Excellent. No problem. <laughs>